All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher, joined by Drew Dinsick, the whale capper, coming to you from a hotel room in Las Vegas where I've just found out that the Fuji water, which I thought was complimentary, is not. <laughs> uh, not only is it not complimentary, it costs $25 each, and uh, <laughs> I'm, three, I'm three down as well. And they're, they're big things, but um, yeah, it's not a great start to uh, live in Vegas. But Anyway, uh, no more talk about that. Let's talk about the NFL. We're going to discuss three of the Sunday matchups, and then we're going to talk coach of the year and offensive rookie of the year. I think these are the two most interesting and messed up awards markets. But let's start off with Jets-Dolphins. Uh, the line for a time was Jets plus three. That got hammered pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And now it's Dolphins minus one uh, with the expectation that it will be Skylar Thompson or Teddy Bridgewater. Probably Skylar Thompson thinks so at this point. Total 38 and a half. What's your lean on this game? Yes. Uh, so, Jay, if you're doing Vegas, like I hope you're doing Vegas, $25 is worth every penny uh, for that water, I think. So, um, that said, it's been, it's been a weird 36 hours. It's great to be back talking football. But uh, this week 18 slate is super Super tough. I thought there were going to be some pretty obvious ways to capitalize, given uh, you know this. That's the norm. The final week of the season, but uh, you know the, the markets have been very active. People are not letting these uh, mature slowly. Uh, there's been some pretty aggressive moves, and the Jets was one of them. This was actually in the three and a half four range uh, when it opened up on Sunday, which was mind blowing. Um, but uh, the close, you know, plus one, <clears throat> a pick em ish effectively for this game is fair in my mind uh you want to give the miami dolphins a little bit of shade because they do have better playmakers on offense that's fine uh but this is a great matchup this is a really uh it should be a really fun game both uh you know jets are not going to come in and lay down despite being eliminated from playoff competition like that's not the mo of this team they are clearly building something for the future and you know there's there's not meaningful draft positional value in the balance here if the Jets win or lose. So I think you're going to get an honest effort out of them, which is, I think, why the market supports this team so much. Uh, in general, Skylar Thompson has shown us nothing to say that he's going to be able to unlock what is one of the better pass defenses in the NFL right now. Um, Jets in general coming in with a healthy pass rush against the Miami Dolphins offensive line that is now, again, battered and bruised and uh, and, and limited. So um, Dolphins are in trouble here. Uh, I It would be fun to see them find their way into the playoff mix just because if Tua is healthy, that's a much more compelling playoff game than any of the other seven seeds might be uh, in the AFC fabric. But uh, that said, I think the the Jets are allowed to get the win. I, I make this a fair uh, market now, so not running to get involved here. But, um, you know, continue to monitor uh, situation with the Jets quarterback. Uh, if for whatever reason they decide to, you know, tack away from Mike White, then I'm all of a sudden very nervous about the Jets uh, being alive in this one. I give Mike White a pass last week. Uh, you know, playing in Seattle in that moment was not necessarily fair considering what they were asking to do coming off of that injury. But uh, he should be right in Miami in this spot. And uh, so as long as he's kind of healthy and given the you know, thumbs up to go in this one, then this is uh, Jets or pass. Yep, I'm with you as well. I think <clears throat> the Jets are the side here. Um, I just think with Miami, like people are thinking about this team as – as being a similar team to what they were previously, and it's just the drop off from Tua, but it's not just Tua. It's like Teron Armstead is banged up, Bradley Chubb, Xavier and Howard. Like they've just reached critical mass with their injuries where they can't withstand an injury at the quarterback position now, like they previously potentially could have. So, yeah, I believe in the Jets' defense. I mean, Seattle scored 23, but basically did nothing after a good start. Like the Seattle Path game did almost nothing. Like Source Gardner held DK Mecca after three receiving yards. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that the Jets are the side here. Talking about DK Metcalf and those Seahawks, the Rams are six and a half point dogs in Seattle. The total is 41 and a half. So the Seahawks, if they win this game, they would get in with a Detroit win uh, in on Sunday Night Football. So they have plenty to play for, given that the Lions are obviously very live there. Do you think six and a half is fair? Um, I think it's a little bit. Uh, I think it's a little bit advantageous to take the Rams at that price. Um, I know the Rams were pretty atrocious last week against the Chargers. 
Uh, that game, I don't know that the box score really did justice, though, how live the Rams were in that one. Uh, you know, a couple of close calls early in that game put the Rams in a, you know, a game state where they could, you know, play a very different style of football than comeback mode. Uh, and I think realistically, the way that they played against the Seahawks the last time out, uh, you know, with Wolford uh, now, you know, being replaced by Baker Mayfield, the Rams are live to pull off an upset here. Uh, nothing that the Seahawks have done in the final quarter of the season outside of last week's win against the Jets has been any way, shape, or form impressive. Um, and I think uh, expecting them to win with margin here is a tall ask. Um, this time of year, must win does not equal must cover by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, six and a half points in my by my numbers is uh, you know, a two-point surcharge just because the Seahawks are playing for something and the Rams are not. Uh, and that's not correct. Uh, this is, you know, is a pretty you know, pretty um, tried and true spot week 18 to take the points with the dog who's quote unquote playing for nothing against a team who must win. So uh, I think this is Rams you know, plus the six and a half is a fair play. Uh, and then even more interesting. I think you can take the Rams money line here and make some plus EV parlays with the Lions. If the Rams do win this game, then that Lions Packers market is going to change appreciably. Uh, and so it's ba basically by nature, uh, you know, you're kind of giving yourself a, a plus EV bet on the Lions if the Rams do win. So parlaying them uh, makes that a guaranteed plus EV play. So uh, I'm going to do that for a small stake. Some of that is covering my liability on the Packers going to the playoffs. Uh, but uh, I think that's effectively the most, uh, um, you know, the, I think that I think playing the Rams plus six and a half and then parlaying Rams money line with Lions money line is is the way to attack these two games. Yeah, I think the Rams are the side here too. I think the concern is that the Seattle pass game, like this is now three months of it just not being close to the level that it was uh, in the first five weeks of the season when Geno Smith had the best PFF grade uh, in the sport. Uh, so I think that the Rams plus six and a half is the side. I think Seattle as well, pay attention to their injury report, particularly with Ryan Neal, who's one of mm -hmm. the best in the league and he's been out the past couple of weeks and yep. wasn't exposed by Mike White who just yeah just didn't just, just didn't have it um against the Seahawks in Seattle but and look it's not like Baker Mayfield and and the Rams receivers are ne necessarily the best group to expose uh a weak safety core but certainly that's a concern for for Seattle for a defense that has inched back towards vague competence but still is a clearly below average unit Let's talk about the Sunday night game on NBC and Peacock. Lions plus four and a half at the Packers. The total is 48 and a half. So how, how much do you think the line would move if the Rams win? Uh, so <clears throat> this to me is a line that is anchored on the current money line expectation that the, um, that the Seahawks win 68, 69% of the time. Right, which means if they lose, then I think that this shifts pretty significantly down to Lions plus three. Uh, and if they win, uh, then this probably goes to six. Uh, I have not bet this game one way or the other because I am waiting for the opportunity to take as many points as possible with the Lions. Uh, outside of the fact that if the, I think you almost have to have a Rams Lions money line parlay before this, you know, before the Rams game starts. Obviously, that's 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 obviously the case. Um, you know, once that, you know, once the Rams result, once the Rams Seahawks result is in the books, uh, you'll see this market kind of fi take final form. Uh, and again, I think a, a Seahawks win, this goes to six, a Seahawks loss, this goes to three. Um, Lions match up decently well against the Packers. This is not going to be a weather game. Uh, it's going to be cold, but by all accounts, it's going to be dry. It doesn't look like there's going to be significant wind. Um, and in general, you know, Jared Goff in those conditions should be able to operate this offense effectively. The Packers defense has been playing great of late, but their statistics are skewed by some very, very fortuitous takeaways. Like they're all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the 2006 bears in terms of taking the ball away on defense. Uh, and I don't know that that's long-term sustainable and, um, you know, Packers can be, you know, the Lions have a decent two-way attack. Their running game and, and passing game are balanced to when everything is firing and the Packers uh, are susceptible to being pushed around by a physical team. So I'm, I'm, you know, again, as a Packers guy, I'm very, very nervous about this game. I kind of don't even really care if the Seahawks win or lose. I think the Lions are, are, are live to, uh, to play spoiler here. So I want as many points as possible with the Lions. I think that they 
uh, are going to give the Packers everything they can handle. And, you know, the Packers offense has played some difficult defensive assignments lately, uh, at least some pass rushes that can get after Aaron Rodgers. And that's kind of kept the offense from really uh, kind of showing its final form. Um, but, and, and they're going up against the Lions defense that has a lot of those same characteristics of, yeah, they can be beat it through the air. There are some weak spots in that secondary, surely. Um, and so if the Packers offensive line shows up and plays a complete game and keeps, uh, likes of Houston and Hutchinson, you know, off the, off the, uh, stat sheet, uh, then the Packers are going to find theirs offensively here. So, uh, over 49, a hair low, um, at, you know, kind of just under the assumption that, uh, you know, there could be some takeaways. The Packers offense is going to look a little bit better than it has just because the Lions defense is somewhat weak. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, this is this is going to be a fun game. I'm glad they put this in the primetime spot. Um, but this is uh, the, the main looks I have for this one really are playing the Lions to cover my uh, my Packers exposure. Yeah, I might skew to the over as well. I don't think either of these defenses are good uh and all, I think <laughs> back to the lions game against carolina where it seemed like the lions defense particularly their run defense was trending towards pretty pretty solid overall but that carolina mm-hmm. game was a complete catastrophe uh and it's not like the carolina offense is something to be afraid of as tampa bay showed so yeah i don't understand what that performance was i would be encouraged that Goff. If you are betting the over, that Goff was really good outdoors in that game against a pretty solid uh, defense. So, yeah, I think that the over is the play in this one. And I would skew to the Lions plus four and a half. I think there's a bit more scope for that to get to three and a half as opposed to go the other way. Can I ask uh, you a quick opinion question yeah. on Goff? Yeah. Um, so the advanced statistics would tell you over the last half of the season, he's been the best quarterback in the NFL. His EPA per play exceeds Pat Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, Dak Prescott, Joe Burrow, he's been better than all of those guys. Um, do you think that is in some way opponent, you know, is, is, is opponent driven that he's just happened to have, you know, kind of good situations, indoor games, easy opponents, easy defenses. And that's, that's why, or is there a signal here that Jared Goff is actually like a top tier quarterback? No, he's not. He's not a top tier okay. quarterback. Um, looking at these defenses that he's played since the Lions have, Going on this hot stretch, uh, Green Bay pass defense, not very good. Chicago, disaster. Giants, not very good. Buffalo, good. Jacksonville, bad. Minnesota, horrific. Jets, good, but he didn't play well in that game outside of you know the dump off fourth and one play that um, what Brock Wright took to the house. Uh, and then Carolina, which is solid, but um and then chicago which i yeah, i don't i don't believe in jared goff i think uh i think jared goff is the what that 17th 18th best quarterback in the league that type of right what you like jared goff no in this system though is good you know, yeah. they have a bunch of good weapons <laughs> they have a bunch well, of good i mean hey, hey, like he's getting it done with guys who we weren't expecting to be meaningful players uh he's he's turned brock Wright into a guy who knew <laughs> i mean yeah. i yeah, the book on Goff has always been that if you keep him clean, he's very good. Uh, but it's just the issue where whenever he's had a a wonky offensive line, it just all burns in hell. Like he just can't just can't play under pressure. But yeah, if you give him an offensive line, then then he is a very solid quarterback. I just think that Kirk Cousins, Derek Carr, Daniel Jones, like I think these guys would be doing similar stuff. Right. Okay. in this offense but, that's um, fair it's funny to me that the number the, 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 tied for second for receiving touchdowns on the lions this season shane zilstra <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's uh, like he's he's getting it done in very uh very interesting ways uh yeah. and i guess you know t- t- I, maybe it's just more of a hat tip to the uh the offensive coordinator ben johnson who has not gotten a lot of run this year um but he is putting something pretty cool together up there in detroit yep no, no, 100%. Yeah, Zilstra, three touchdowns uh, against the Panthers. Uh, the legend of Zilstra <laughs> was born that day in Carolina. All right, before we get into Coach of the Year, just a reminder, if you don't have the NBC Sports Predictor app, go download it now. The contests are free and easy to play. And you have a shot to win thousands this weekend by predicting what will happen in the NFL and the Premier League. That includes $100,000 up for grabs by guessing the outcome between the Lions and Packers in our Sunday Night 7 contest. My Gunners drew a plus 180 to win the title, and it's starting to get a little too real. Uh, Let's talk about Coach of the Year, which is my favorite topic on earth at the moment. Uh, (laughs) Sirianni, for some reason, is the favorite at plus 160. I don't understand that. 
Carl Shanahan is plus 175. Brian Dable is plus 260. And I think realistically, there ends the viable candidates, I think. Doug Peterson is 10 to 1. Zach Taylor, 20 to 1. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think those guys are winning. Uh, I think this is a three-horse race between Sirianni, Shanahan, and Dable. I'll um, shower you with my thoughts in a sec, but what do you make at the top of this market? Yeah, so all of the voters who I have talked to have said the same thing, uh, which is until Sirianni concedes the one seed, he is the choice. Now that was only one person, but it's still is it's it's, it's uh, that's that's the reason I think that he is still at the top is just basically if he still gets the one seed, people are going to presumably give him a pass for the fact that the two losses down the stretch came with Gardner Minshew and you know frankly one of those losses was very competitive like they were right there in that game with the ball and a chance to win late uh, you know against the Cowboys so um, if he takes care of business and you know they get the what is looking like the expected. 14 point win against the Giants this week, um, you know, with Hertz back, presumably, then, you know, I think Sirianni will get some support. The thing is, coach of the year is going to be ranked choice voting. We know this. This is new. And so there will be some surprises with the way that the awards voting breaks this year, I would expect. Um, for the coach of the year, the voters get three choices. I think almost every ballot is going to have Sirianni, Shanahan, and Brian Dable. There may be some ballots where Dable gets left off because, you know, he's got only nine wins. And, you know, in general, like coach of the year, you, they, they, you tend to have a, a floor of you need 10 wins. Um, and so he may suffer a bit from attrition at the bottom of ballots for a couple of voters, um, which I think makes it fair that he is the third choice here. I bet a little bit of Dayball yesterday at four to one, just because I'm trying to play defense here. I got a lot of Shanahan. I got a lot of Sirianni, um, but Shanahan, I think, is a scary. Uh, he has a scary narrative. If you want to, you know, if if you want to try to take on uh, Sirianni, and I'll let you make the case for Shanahan because I think that's where your loyalties lie in this market. Um, I will just say that this is a three way coin flip. The way I read it. And everybody should be kind of around plus 200. Uh, and, you know, it's going to be a full on month long sweat waiting for these to be counted and announced because you're going to need every single voters first, second and third place to actually figure out who's the winner. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think Sirianni could still steal it. That's that would be the most profitable for me. So I'm hoping I'm hopeful for it. Uh, but what is the Shanahan case here? Well, I think if you just like the way that I view this market in terms of like the the information that's available to price this, one, obviously you look at the precedent for the award and who typically wins based on just everyone's cases. Two, all the mid-season awards columns that people wrote where Brian Dable was the mainly the consensus choice when he was like six and two, and that was beating Sirianni at eight and oh at that point. And then Tom Pelissero did an executive poll on uh, NFL.com two weeks ago where Sirianni won, but he only had seven and a half out of 26 votes at that point. Kyle Shanahan had six. No one else had more than three and a half. And since then, Sirianni's gone 0-2. Shanahan's gone 2-0. and And Brian Dable has clinched a playoff spot. So, look, none of that stuff in isolation um, is is going to be definitive but i think you you weigh it all up and what i come back to is that when people are comparing these names on the ballots i think they're going to look at sirianni goes 14 and 3 gets the one seed but finishes with losing momentum losing two out of three and more importantly going zero and two with his backup quarterback uh, and then you look at Kyle Shanahan's case where he's going to win the season we assume that he's going to beat arizona as a 14 point favorite Shanahan's going to end the season on a 10-game winning streak. He didn't go 0-2 with his backup quarterback. He went 6-0 and with his third-string quarterback, who was the last pick in the draft. And also, I think it's kind of more evident Shanahan's coaching than Sirianni's. Where Shanahan, you look at the scheme, you look at how wide open George Kittle is for these touchdowns. Like I think that just people kind of feel the coaching of Kyle Shanahan. I think they feel the coaching of Brian Dayball as well more than Sirianni. Like, I don't think people can really point to what does Nick Sirianni do? Like, what does he specifically do as a coach outside of being aggressive on fourth down, which I'm not sure is fair or not, but that would be my breakdown. I think that 
I just think when people stack up the cases of Shanahan versus Sirianni, that people are going to land on Shanahan. To me, Dable is just the wild card because you can't really compare what he's doing to Sirianni or Shanahan. And so he may just win. But I would make Shanahan the favorite at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. I would make Dable the second favorite. And then I would have Sirianni. So they're not writing him off because, you know, they did have a nine and a half win total and they're going to win 14 games and yeah. get the one seed. So I think he's live. I just, I just think he's third. But it uh, looks like we have a comment. Mm. How is Andy Reid not a candidate? Lost Tyree Kill and has a rookie defense. But uh, we'll put Shanahan in the running with all the same weapons and the addition of McCaffrey. Dable should win. I think the thing here is that just that Reid has Patrick Mahomes and Kyle Shanahan has gone 6-0 and with Brock Purdy. Uh, <laughs> and people yeah. are just going to not give... Andy Reid a couple of years ago was like 14 and one going into the last week of the season, which was meaningless and didn't factor into coach of the year at all. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't think people give Reid credit because of Mahomes, but what do you think, Drew? That's exactly correct. Also, the weight of expectation coming into the season matters, which is why Sirianni is still in the conversation. You just brought it up. Their win total was nine and a half. This team was 10 to one to get the one seed, All right, Like the, the Niners were, and granted it was with a, two quarterbacks ago the Niners were kind of you know in the conversation for best team in the NFC's just based on the talent on that roster uh whereas the Eagles li literally had to make a, a leap now if you want to say how did this happen yes yeah, some of it is the coaching developed Jalen Hurts that they should get credit for that surely uh some of it is the way that they you know they developed their offensive scheme uh you know around Hurts and you know utilizing the weapons that they put on that roster uh in a way that really kind of you know, full bloom for this offense. Um, one of the lead offenses in the NFL this season, no question. Um, and they should get credit for that. Now, it came against a very weak schedule. People will forget that. Uh, and it came in, a, you know, the sequence is going to affect things because they lost some games towards the end of the season. And it's a lot of this award, a lot of the awards come down to what, what you know, what have you done for me lately? Um, if you're looking for anything to hang your hat on to hold out hope on on Sirianni, uh, if you're out there with this big old Sirianni ticket, um, it's tough for me to see the one seed Eagles getting completely shut out of the awards. And that's where they would be if Sirianni doesn't get the coach of the year. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? I guess the thing is, is that the one seed Eagles in 2017 got completely shut out of awards too, right? And Doug Peterson went from, point. he went from seven and nine to 13 and three and did it with the last month of the season, not having Carson Wentz who was an MVP candidate, and he got one coach of the year vote out of 50, which I still don't really understand, but but that happened. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's a fun one, and uh, looking forward to seeing how the last week shakes out. If Brian Dable beats the Eagles, then he automatically wins coach of the year. So that's the one thing I think to really watch for, but I don't think he's going to win. Anyway, download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster, Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in the App Store today. All right, Offensive Rookie of the Year. I think we can kind of spend less time on this one because I just think it's impossible to price Brock Purdy and how people are going to treat him in the market. Uh, I think that the market is mostly correct now, except Garrett Wilson is way too short and Purdy is a little bit too long. Ken Walker is the favorite on points bet, minus 125. Garrett Wilson, plus 200. Brock Purdy plus 450. And then I think the only other, well, I think there's two other guys who could win, though they are long shots. And that's Kenny Pickett at 20 to 1 and Chris Olave at 30 to 1. What's your handicap here? Whew. I think this should go to Garrett Wilson. Really? I think Why? so. I think he's made the most meaningful impact on any team this year. Kenneth Walker is fine, but. You know, his, his absence in the key part of the season where the Seahawks, you know, kind of fell out of the playoff race was hugely impactful um, and availability matters. Garrett Wilson uh, has played through some very, very poor quarterback play and, and still compiled a thousand yard season. He's in the top 20 among all receivers this year, uh, which is you know, darn impressive. Um, and, you know, he's made the specific game breaking plays that really kind of helped to put, you know, put the Jets, uh, you know, a huge leg forward in terms of kind of this rebuild here. So I, I think it ought to go to Garrett Wilson. Now what the voters will, you know, how they all decide is a very, very tough question. Um, it, this is usually based on volume. 
you know, this is usually literally just kind of breaking down the stats and seeing who was, who got the most opportunity and who did the most with that opportunity, which you can make a case for either Walker or Wilson in that regard. Um, but your, your points about Purdy are fair. The fact that he only started what, six, seven games, what's it going to be when it's all said and done? Six, six, start it's going to be six games played in eight. Yeah. yeah. Undefeated through six games. Is that enough? It's a very, very tough question. The rest of this Niners roster is so freaking talented. Uh, and he, yeah, they haven't all been available, right? <laughs> Debo Samuel only played, what, two games with them? Um, but, it, you know, it's it's, it's still it's a, such a talent. You know, the, the defense gets the Lions share of the credit for why they're successful, um, fair or not. Um, and, you know, his, his numbers, at least in terms of the way he's you know, the quality of his performance, not that different than, uh, you know, the likes of say a Sam Darnold, um, you know, so it's, is it, is it that, you know, outstanding, eye popping, impressive? Uh, it's, it's not obvious to me. Um, I think you can write off Kenny Pickett cause I think the Steelers lose to the Browns this week. That's maybe one of my favorite looks of the week. <laughs> week 18 card is Browns plus the points, but Browns on the money line. Um, but if the Steelers do find their way in, people will try to make the case for Kenny Pickett, I suppose. Um, a Wave fair price at 30 to one, just because people have kind of given up on what the saints really are bringing to the table in terms of offense, which is probably not fair, but a is a little behind Garrett Wilson in basically every category. So, uh, I get it. Um, I've never really had a good read on the pulse of this market whatsoever. I think that the price on Kenneth Walker is a bet against at minus 125. But some of that is just, I have a tough time wrapping my head around, are the Seahawks really getting two awards when they miss the playoffs? Yeah. Well, I think with Walker, like compared to Wilson, the issue, like Walker has more yards than Wilson. He has nine touchdowns to Wilson's four. He has a, he's on a team that has a better record. And he's done this missing multiple games, whereas Wilson's played every game. It's the same yeah. thing with like I I think Olave is more deserving than Wilson because Olave's got like 32 less receiving yards and has played two and a half less games than Wilson, as more efficient in terms of yards per route run, all of that kind of stuff. To me, the most deserving candidate is Purdy because it's gonna be if we assume that he plays well against the Cardinals, which I think is a fair assumption, it's gonna be I think that six games of being a quarterback with a passer rating over 100, a QBR that's top five in the league. I just think that's more valuable than Kenneth Walker getting 1,100 yards from scrimmage for the Seahawks. Like, I think that just the the quarterback value proposition is just so significant. And the Purdy, yes, his context is about as favorable, favorable as you can get with Shanahan calling plays with the talent, but still to be able to, to execute like he has, I think that makes him the most deserving candidate. I just don't think he's going to win because too many people are just going to leave him off ballot because of the games. And I think everyone's just going to have Kenneth Walker uh, on the ballot or if Wilson or Olave, if one of them blows up um, in, in this last week and kind of emerges as the skill position guy over others, mm -hmm. uh, then I think that, you know, that person is just going to be on every single ballot. They'll be first or second and Purdy's going to be third or off ballot um, a little bit. But um, yeah, can, what do you think? Yeah, can I ask you a question real quick? So the uh, I've heard other people in the like doing awards takes who are kind of using rush, you know, like yards from you know scrimmage yards, basically rushing plus plus receiving, right? I don't even know that I give the voters a ton of credit for getting to that level of detail. I think that if you're a running back, they look at rushing yards. I think if you're a receiver, they look at receiving yards, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that in general that. Make, you know, that handicaps Kenneth Walker a bit. Like he is still what sixty four yards away from a thousand yard run, run, you know rushing season. If he doesn't have a thousand yard rushing season, I don't think he gets consideration here. Like there's a thousand yard rookie rusher every single year. We see it every year. It's not even really that impressive, especially with the seventeen game season now. Yes, he's done it with only ten starts, presumably, but uh, or eleven starts, I guess. Once this weekend is gone, but what would you make? You know, he, he's only getting. 66 yards a game so it's going to be very 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 close for him uh one way or the other here to get to uh a thousand yards well you know are you you know how much does this week's game matter for kenneth walker i think it matters a fair bit i do agree the 1k rushing is important and your scrimmage yards you don't get as much credit for i think he's what they're six and a half point favorites rams do have a good run defense but no aaron donald obviously so he's probably i don't know top of my head like 
minus 140 to get 64 yards at least. Like okay. it's a favorite. Okay. So at that point, I think you should be right. But yeah, this market is a mess. Uh, I wouldn't be really getting involved in anyone at the current prices. I would bet if I was going to have one bet, it would be Purdy at plus 450 just because people might just arrive at like all of these candidates kind of blah. So we'll give it to the guy who goes 6-0 and as the last pick in the draft and, you know, has insane stats on a per game basis. But it is a bit of a mess. All right, we're done. So don't forget to check out NBCSportsEdge.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks for those of you watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to subscribe and rate us from Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick. We'll be back tomorrow.